10. The name of it is, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the, the worst blasphemy against the Bible I think I've ever heard. That's the title of it. And uh, it, the, the link was shared by one of our followers. And um, so I went to it and I was like, I could not believe what I was seeing and hearing. You know, I expect liberals to deny large portions of the Bible as being mythology, um, hearsay, uh, parts of it, not the, not the words of God. The, I don't know if you kn know this or not, but several years ago, probably about 25 years ago, the United Methodist denomination set forth and they had their best scholars it's not saying a lot um, to go through the four gospels if you have a red letter bible you can find the words of jesus in it through, with the red letters and their job was to categorize the things that jesus said in the bible in three categories one category one jesus probably said this Category two was uh, Jesus may not have said this, but could have. Category three was Jesus did not say this. And they went through all four Gospels and took all the red letter words and they divided them up in categories. And they were, there was a whole list of verses that they said Jesus did not say this. Even though the Bible records that he did. Matthew says it. Mark says it. Luke says it. John says it, they all say it, but, they, but the, the scholars said that Jesus didn't say that. What I saw Thursday was worse than that, far worse than that. There's a man, uh, and he's, got, he's got a deep southern accent, I thought he might have been from Arkansas, but he was from Tennessee, and it's hard to find any information out about the guy. Um, but anyway, his main... Focus, he said, for the last 47 years, he got a revelation from Jesus. And that revelation was that the Bible, this book right here, is an idol. And you shouldn't have one. And that if you have a Bible and you read it and you believe it, that's the mark of the beast. And I'm like, oh, that's a new one. And so I pulled up one of his videos. Now, he's, he died in 2021. Imagine the surprised look when he stands before a thrice holy God. And in Revelation 5, there is what in God's right hand? A book. His statement is, close the book. Don't read it. And he's so ignorant, so hypocritical, he uses verses, he cherry picks verses that make it sound like you shouldn't read the Bible. And like I said, he's been dead now two, two some odd years, two and a half years, something like that, almost yeah, maybe three. But anyway, some, I think one of his followers is carrying on uh, his quote unquote ministry and uh, putting old videos up as new ones uh the one that i saw was uh dated four months ago uh but the guy's been dead longer than that so it must have been something he recorded years ago him and his wife and uh i mean he just goes on and on and on for about i only watched one video and that was enough for me i can only handle so much blasphemy and then i gotta say that's enough and, I, and i'm not telling anybody what the guy's name is, what his website is, nothing, because I don't want you reading it. 
because somebody weak in the faith might listen to that and be hooked into it. But I'm telling you, the Bible is the Word of God. Let me hear somebody say amen besides me. It is the Word of God. God said, write it down. He told Moses to write it down. He told Jeremiah to write it down. He told Isaiah to write it down. Uh, he told John to write it down. All the, Hosea, he told him to write it down that he may run that readeth it. Uh, write it down, Moses, for a memorial that it may be for the uh, time to come forever. The whole purpose of writing something down is so that it can be remembered correctly. Because when we hear sentences from people, we always disfigure those sentences and those phrases. We always change the facts of what somebody said to us. It's human nature. It has, it's the result of our fallen state. We're not perfect. And so, you know, you've probably played this game where somebody whispered a sentence in your ear and you passed it around the room. And by the time it got around, it's completely different than what it started out being. So God said, write it down. My goodness, the earliest that we have of the written word of God was God writing the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone so that they could not be altered or changed or added to or taken away from. God himself wrote the words and he actually said that the word of God is spoken you must, and he's one of these uh, guys that when he says the word, when he says the phrase Holy Ghost, it's one word, Holy Ghost. It's like one syllable, Holy Ghost. He said, you got to be full of the Holy Ghost and then you'll get the word of God in you and then you'll speak the word of God. But the moment you write it down, he said, that's the devil. And I'm like, it is. Well, I've heard some pretty stupid stuff. But that, that tops up there as like the top five. And like I said, you can expect liberal theologians, liberal scholars to cast doubt on the Word of God, to say that, you know, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, but they say it probably wasn't Paul. Um, that's, that's something I learned in Bible college, is that anytime you have a book, especially in the New Testament, with the author's name on it, uh, especially at the beginning, Paul always started out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, they, they always had some reason why it wasn't Paul that wrote it, or it wasn't James that wrote James' epistle, or it wasn't John that wrote Revelation, and on and on and on and on. And you expect that out of liberal theologians, liberal scholars. Um, you don't expect that out of people who seem to be somewhat conservative. Uh, but this guy was just so far out of it, it was crazy. He said, Brother George, he said that Jesus told him that Timothy, young Timothy, was, was under two covenants. Mount Sinai covenant, the Ten Commandments, and um, Jesus' new, new covenant. Said that he was under both. And I'm going, where in the world did you get that? You can't be under two opposing contracts. It's always one. But anyway, um, yeah, that had me stirred up a little bit. I thought I'd pass that along to you. Um, and yeah, here's, here's another. If we look at um, Revelation chapter 10, the mighty angel, if you look in verse 2, what does he have in his hand? A book. He's got a book in his hand. God sent that angel down, if, that, if that's Jesus... Jesus comes down with the little book open in his hand, just like Moses came down with the two testimonies of the law, the two tablets in his hand. Um, Jesus comes down with the little book open. Um, Jesus tells us, read the book. God tells us, read the book. Uh, Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word scripture itself means it's been scribed. It's been written down. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So anyway, he had in his hand a little book open. He set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, who did their homework? 
Who did their homework? I wonder who did their homework. Anybody? Do you even remember what the homework was? A new cubby would know. Kyle? Yeah. That's a different, that's a different homework assignment. That's the one you didn't turn in. No. <laughs> what are the seven thunders? What are they? Let's read verse 3. And cried with a loud voice. As when a lion roareth. We looked at that. That lion is Jesus. Okay. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And there's a clue here. The number seven is part of it. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. So, just if we just look at just, the, uh, just a, a scan of these two verses, uh, we, can, we can deduce this. Number one, uh, the, what the seven thunders said must be important. Um, number two, what the seven thunders said must be for a specific time. And apparently not for, let's say, today. Because we don't know what the seven thunders actually said. We don't know what they said. Um, and if you... If you remember, I did a little study back months ago about what a seal is and how a seal is represented in Scripture. A seal is used to preserve things. Uh, even now, um, people bought a seal a meal or you bought Tupperware and you burped the Tupperware. Remember that? And you put the lid on it and burped it and got all the air out and snapped it shut and so it sealed and so your food will be, it'll last longer inside that environment in your refrigerator. So it's used to, pre to preserve things. Uh, but another interpretation of why something is sealed, um, think about this. Years ago, there was, uh, I don't know if they still do this or not, but years ago, people used to, when they built new buildings, um, they would put things in a, what do they call it? Not a time machine. Yeah, time capsule. And they would put the date that the capsule was sealed. They'd bury it down in the ground somewhere or bury it in a cornerstone. And uh, then a lot of times if that uh, time capsule had a date on it, they would say, okay, 50 years from now uh, on uh, April 7th, uh, 2024, this capsule is to be opened and its contents revealed to the world because we forget things that are 50, 60, 70 years old, sometimes 100 years, uh, or whenever the building that they put it in is torn down and they look inside the cornerstone, often they'll find things that were placed inside that hollow cornerstone uh, that are to remain for a certain date. And it appears that the seven thunders and what they uttered are reserved for a certain time, a certain date. My guess is that as with anything that is sealed in the Bible, like the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is sealed, its meaning and interpretation is sealed. Uh, if you come across somebody on social media that says that they have unsealed Daniel's uh, the book of Daniel, they're lying. They're just flat out lying. Uh, Jack Van Impey. I used to watch him every Saturday night and um, back in the early 90s. And um, he, I remember he came up with a series of videos called Daniel, the book of Daniel Unsealed. 
And at the time, I thought, boy, that ought to be interesting. Oh, I might get that. They only wanted like $200 for them. So that kind of put me out of the mood. But anyway, uh, he was trying to make money off of his interpretation of the book of Daniel. Well, the problem is, it's not unsealed yet. I believe that when Christ takes the book from the Father's right hand and looses those seals, I think everything that is sealed is going to be unsealed, including the seven thunders. The number seven means something. What does that mean to you? What does number seven mean to you? Perfection, God's perfection. There are seven spirits of God. So we could say definitely that these are seven spiritual sayings and that the Holy Ghost has something to do with that. Um, and I'll show you that in a little bit, okay? Um, we're kind of overlooking something. This idea of thunder, okay? Now we know what it means in life. What it means to me is Run quickly and get undercover somewhere because I don't like lightning anymore. I don't. Uh, what was that? 18 years ago, April 1st, I was electrocuted, almost killed. And so when I see lightning and I hear thunder, I run and hide. I don't like it. I used to. I used to sit out and when I'd hear thunder, I'd, or I'd, when I'd see lightning, I'd count. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four. Because that's how many miles away the, the lightning is. I don't count anymore. I'm just like, boom, get undercover. Um, but anyway, what do thunders represent according to the word of God? Now, you could have studied that and you would have come across some interesting things well, let's do that this morning take your bible turn to exodus chapter 20 oh wow you know what exodus 20 is you're exercising your fingers to get them used to turning to pages in your bible um first samuel 2 verse 10 the adversaries of the Lord. Now, think of this now in the context of what we're reading in Revelation 10. Okay, think of it in that, along those lines. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. That is a, that is a theme throughout the Bible. If you remember in, when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream, and Daniel gave not only what the dream was, but he gave the interpretation of the dream. We see the four kingdoms of gold, silver, brass, iron, and then iron mixed with miry clay, which they don't mix ever. And then a stone cut without hands. That's Christ. Men, men did not create Jesus. Jesus creates men. Okay. The stone cut without hands, um, flies through the air, targets the feet of this great image, destroys the feet, the toes, and once you destroy what it's standing on, it can't stand any longer, and the whole thing falls. And so what, what does God say, or what did Daniel say, was the meaning of that? That once the stone hit the feet of that idol, that image fell, and it broke into literally thousands of pieces like chaff and it was just blown away and gone forever you know when you break something into thousands of pieces you can't put it back together again it's like putting spilled water back in the bucket it ain't going okay so this is a comedy uh isaiah said i think it was isaiah or jeremiah said that um god has ha, he's taken rahab the leviathan and broken his or broke his head into pieces, something like that. I just butchered that verse, but anyway, uh, anyway, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he what? Thunder upon them. 
The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. That word anointed points you right to Jesus Christ. The word Messiah means the anointed one. Christ in Greek means the same thing, the anointed one. And so right here, uh, God thunders, the, the Lord thunders from heaven. So whose voice are we listening to? I believe so. We're going to keep going. Turn to um, 1 Samuel 7. Just a couple of little pages. 1 Samuel 7, verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. And the Philistines were always the enemies of God's people. So think of the Philistines as the armies of the Antichrist in the last days. Think of the Philistines as everybody that voted for Sleepy Joe. Think of the Philistines as your sins. Okay? They're always contrary to you. They're always trying to conquer you and to destroy you. The Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them. And they were smitten before Israel discomfited them or discomfited them. The idea is the Philistines are drawing near uh, as one man. And yet God thundered a great thunder upon them and scattered them all over the place, making it easier for the army of Israel to destroy them. Um, turn to 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22, verse, ooh, I like some of this. Look at verse 12, I'm going to read down to it. 2 Samuel 22, verse 12, he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. In other, in other words, God has to have a cloud covering him. Because if God's glory were to be seen by mortal men, we would vanish into a vapor. It would kill us, literally kill us. God's glory is so bright um, that it would destroy us. So he always is hiding behind thick clouds. Verse 13, through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. Now verse 14, here it is right here. You want to underline this verse. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered His voice. There it is. So the Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High, who is the Lord, uttered His voice. So now it's telling you in no uncertain terms that the thunder that God thundered when He discomf discomfited the Philistines, when He scattered His adversaries, was His voice. Okay? Okay? Remember, Israel heard God's voice. There were thunders on top of Mount Sinai and the, Is and the Israelites, again, were so terrorized that they asked Moses to be a mediator between them and God. So here, really in, 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 in plain terms, it's telling you that the thunders are the voice of God. So, and we're going to read more of this. Turn to John 12. If the thunders are the voice of God, then what does that mean concerning the seven thunders? That it is God speaking. Seven thunders. You have seven spirits of God. Okay. Um, John chapter 12, verse 27. Let me 
fingers are dry this morning. Let's look at it. Let's see, am I in right place? John 12, 27. Jesus said, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. And let me stop here and just give you some practical teaching. Um, I've been praying like this uh, for quite a while when I, when I learned this, when God showed it to me. You will never, ever, ever have a problem having your prayers answered when you pray in accordance with, number one, God's will. God will never, He will never, um, well, how can I say this? God, contrary to what the charismatic movement says, the word faith movement, where they say all you do is make a positive confession and you do it with faith and God will give you what you ask for. I was listening to Jesse Duplantis the other day. He was, and his heresies seemed to get worse and worse over time. He, he was bragging to his church that um, he ran out of money. So he asked God for 50 million. And God gave him $50 million. He went through that in about a year and a half. And so he asked for another $50 million And God gave him another $50 million. And he went through that. And he asked God for another $50 million And God gave it to him. He's lying through his teeth. Outright lying. He's, he's like saying, if you just ask God right, he'll just load money on top of you. Guy's a heretic. But anyway, if you will pray in such a manner that knowing that what you're asking will bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ, to the name of God. God is a jealous God. God will always have us seek to honor His name. Rather than bring reproach to His name, which we so easily do whenever we sin, whenever someone knows that we have sinned, that brings reproach. You, you say, I'm a Christian. That brings reproach to the name of Christ. When people see you doing the things that you do, that brings reproach to Christ. People say, well, if that's how you Christians are, I, I guess I'm all right then, because I ain't nowhere near like that. But if you will pray so as to honor the name of God, that's what Jesus did. Father, glorify thy name. So then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again, probably at the second coming. Verse 29. Now God said this in an audible voice. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, I love this verse. I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. If you, if we will but lift up and magnify Jesus Christ to this lost and dying world, Jesus will draw people to himself. That's how you got saved, isn't it? You didn't get saved any different than that. You were drawn to Jesus Christ. You were not drawn to Mary. You were not drawn to the Pope. 
You were drawn to Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Redeemer. And when you prayed, you asked Jesus to live in your heart and rule over your life. Be the Lord of your life. And that's so clearly God speaks from heaven. And when people heard it, they said it thundered. Okay, so we have basically the thundering. I believe must be something that God said. Okay, must be something that God said. I'll give you my theory next Sunday. I'm not going to tell you what I think it is. Okay, but I'm going to I'm going to share something with you that I've. Yeah, it's a theory. It's just a theory. All right. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the truthfulness of it. And Lord God, you've not left anything out of this book. Lord, draw us to your word. Draw us, Lord, uh, to Jesus Christ. Father, we seek today to uplift and magnify Jesus, to bring honor to his name, to glorify his name, to glorify you and your holy throne. Lord, help us to do that today. And bless this word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.